What's up everybody, it's Charles. In this video, we are going to be installing a new charge cooler, Ugh, because race car. In addition to the charge cooler, stage two modifications typically include downpipe, turbo inlet pipe, an intake, and of course, we gotta upgrade the software. When it comes to upgrading the charge cooler, this is about reducing our intake air temperatures and reducing heat soak. Now this is primarily going to be seen in a high performance driving situation, but the more we ask of our engine and ask of our turbocharger, the more heat's created. This is also about the balance of having more cooling area without dropping our boost pressures. For this installation, there's a handful of ways to do it just like most anything. The main two ways are pulling the core support in order to get all these components out. The way we're gonna do it is remove the fans, remove the radiator, and that'll allow us pretty easy access to swapping out these coolers. First up, we are going to remove the bumper cover, and the first step there is to remove the center grill. The front grill is held on with two T25 torques. Now for the torques on here, you may wanna put the top ones separate from the bottom ones, since these are gonna be nice and clean, and the bottom ones are probably gonna be dirty. Next, what we need to do is we need to slide the grill forward. Now you have to be extra careful if you have the driver assist package, because there is an electrical connector behind the emblem. This whole piece just slides forward of the vehicle. The easiest way I've found is to kind of put your hand through the vent, pull the top, then pull the bottom. You don't want to pull up on it, you just want to pull it straight forward and then kind of rock it as it comes loose. And then what we'll see behind here is our electrical connector. We'll just go ahead and disconnect that. Set your whole grill to the side so we don't end up scratching it. Next up, we're gonna need to take the series of T25s out between the bumper and the fender liner. It's gonna be up to you if you wanna take the wheels off or if you just want to rotate them left or right to gain access to these. Basically, if you got the tool to get behind here, no need to take the wheels off. For me, I'm gonna go ahead and take the wheels off. Go ahead and take the screws that go from the fender liner to the bumper out and then one facing up that actually goes from the bumper cover to the body of the car. And of course, do the same thing on the other side. Before we pull this bumper cover away, we need to reach behind the wheelhouse liner on the driver's side and disconnect this main plug junction from our bumper. This connector is for all the sensors and everything attached to the bumper. And it's much easier to do it now than while you're trying to balance the bumper cover and reach over and unplug it. Next up, we gotta remove some screws on the bottom. We have two screws on each belt skirt that we're gonna need to take out. We have three screws across the front that we're gonna need to take out. And while we're down here, let's go ahead and get rid of this belly pan. Next up, it is time to actually remove the bumper cover. We're gonna start on the outsides, right where the bumper cover meets the fender. And you're just going to gently pull that bumper away from the fender. It's held in with plastic clips. If it's fighting you, maybe wiggle it back and forth a little bit, but these should come out fairly easily. We're gonna do that for the driver's side as well as the passenger side. Once we have the side sort of peeled out, we're going to move to the center underneath where our grill was. For this, I like to use a plastic trim tool. I really like this one with the 90 degree bend here. Gently lift up on the bumper cover, rock it back and forth a bit, and that'll allow you to slide it forward. Not a bad idea to have someone else helping you holding that bumper cover so it doesn't come crashing down. Starting on the outermost clip and working your way in has been the best method I've found to get this bumper cover off. Before you take this bumper cover off, be sure you got somewhere to put it. And once all the clips are loose, carefully, very carefully, super duper carefully, pull the bumper cover away from the car. Next, let's move up top and start dealing with some of the stuff up here. We're gonna start by taking the air box out. You have the factory air box. Yours is gonna look a little bit different than this one. You're gonna to have to pull that plastic ducting off the front as well as the filter housing right where my filter housing is. That's a pretty basic, easy thing to pull off. If you wanna see a step-by-step, -step, I'll link up the video for doing this intake. You can see that pretty easily. For this one though, it's just going to be one seven millimeter clamp. There we go. Next, what we need to do is we need to remove this coolant line attached to the fan shroud. This is held in with two T30 screws that come from the back, right in front of the engine, to the front of the car. Now we are going to have to remove the fans 
and the radiator. So now it's probably about as good a time as any to drain the coolant. Unfortunately, on the bottom here, there isn't like a coolant drain valve or anything like that. So what we're gonna do is we are going to just take the fitting off on the passenger side. Not that it'd probably be an issue at this point in time, but make sure your car's not hot. Otherwise, well, otherwise you're gonna have all this under pressure. You're gonna have a bad day. All right, while we are down here, let's go ahead and remove our boost pipes. This will make removing the fans and the radiator and everything else so much easier if we just go ahead and do it now. Next, we'll go ahead and take the fitting off at the top side of the radiator. Same way, just a spring clamp. Whoa. Make sure you still have your drip tray underneath there because you might get a big old flow of coolant once this pops off. We didn't get any out of here, but there was some that probably came out the bottom side. Next, let's go ahead and work on getting our fans out. Now we are gonna need to disconnect them, so let's just go ahead and do that first. The connector's located on the driver's side just underneath where the coolant fitting is. Now in order to get this disconnected, you need to pull up on this red locking tab, push the connector release like a normal connector, then pull down on the lower part of the connector that goes to the fans. I'm using a trim tool here to push that connector apart. You can do it by hand, it's just if I did it by hand, you wouldn't be able to see what I was doing. Once it's disconnected, just go ahead and tuck that connector out of the way. Next, we'll go ahead and undo the clips that hold the fan shroud into the radiator. We need to go ahead and compress this top part of the clip in order to allow the shroud to lift up and pass the lock. It's kind of a tricky thing. You gotta push down pretty hard and be careful because this, of course, is all plastic. But once you get it clear, gently pull up on the fan shroud and it'll clear the latch. We're gonna do that same thing for the left side and the right side. Once you release the latches for both sides, lift up on the shroud a little bit, and then we're gonna drop it down through the bottom. Our next step is going to be removing the radiator, and in order to do that, we're gonna to have to release the clips that are behind these two ducting pieces right here. This one on the passenger side, and this one on the driver's side. So let's get those out of the way first. There are a series of three plastic clips that hold each one of these ducting pieces on. What you're gonna do is carefully, with a flat blade screwdriver, go into the channel, push down on the clip, and then just pull it out and lay it to the side. Now this top one on the driver's side is actually where we're gonna access our radiator clips. Now there's one clip all the way at the top, one all the way at the bottom, and one almost all the way at the bottom. So here's the one that's sort of in the middle on the driver's side. We'll do our same thing, take our screwdriver, push down on the tab and release it, and we'll get the one all the way at the bottom. And we can kind of just shimmy this over, and we'll do the same thing on the passenger side, one at the bottom, one about seven or eight inches up from the bottom, and then one at the top. Now that that ducting is out of the way, we need to release the plastic clips that hold the radiator on. Ugh, I feel like a broken record saying, it's held on with plastic clips. However, they're held on with plastic clips. You access the clips through the core support at the top. You can see here is the passenger headlight. Here's the hole that the clips live behind. If we go in there, we can kinda sorta see it. There's a clip right here that we need to release. And then if we go over to the driver's side in the exact same spot, right by the headlight, there's another clip. Now, in order to release these, we're going to take a little bit longer flat blade screwdriver. We're gonna go right into this hole and we're gonna push down on that clip. You really wanna try and get on the center of the clip in order to push it all the way down evenly. While you're pushing down on the clip, take your other hand back behind the radiator and gently pull back. So we're kind of pushing down on the clip and pulling back on the radiator at the same time. You'll gently pull it away from that clip. We'll go ahead and do the driver's side and then we're gonna do exactly the same thing on the passenger side. Go in through the little square, push down on the clip, and gently pull the radiator back towards the back of the car. Once that's done, we're gonna lift the radiator up and out. You may need to hold this coolant hose out of the way, zip tie it, tape it, whatever. Push the radiator back and then just lift it straight up. It's held in at the bottom, just kind of set into two little channels. You may also get some coolant that comes out when you lift the radiator up and out. So you wanna have your drip tray or some cardboard down to catch any of that. 
Next, we need to remove this front plastic bracing piece right here. It's held in with three T30 screws, which are pretty easy. We also have a wire loom that we need to remove from it that tucks along the back. You're only gonna have this if you have adaptive crews. If you don't have adaptive crews for the emblem plugged in, you're not gonna probably have this wiring harness. For this, I really like to take the wiring harness off first before I unbolt the bracket. Oh, be careful here. You don't want your screwdriver to slip and go right into your condenser. All right. There's that out of the way. Go ahead and get those three T30s out of the way. These guys are all the same size, so no worries about which hole they go back into. In addition to those T30s, there's a couple of tabs that you'll need to release as well. This is just on the inside. This would kind of be covered by that ducting we took off earlier. There's one and the other. And get this guy out of the way. Our next step is going to be removing the condenser from the original charge cooler. There's this slide lock that we need to remove from both the top side and the bottom side. Then there's a clip that we need to push in and lift the condenser up and out of this little groove right here in the charge cooler. The slide lock is pretty flexible, so that's going to come off pretty easy. For the top, we just want to push up on it and that'll come right out. For the bottom, it's pretty much the same. You do need to pull away on this bottom tab right here, and then you can just kind of slide this whole bracket up. We can kind of get that right out of our way. Get that leaf out of there too while we're here. Crazy the stuff that gets caught in here. One quick other thing, if you need a little assist prying on this, do two things. Check and make sure it's not blocked up at the top, and you can use a pocket screwdriver to pry it a little bit. Just be really careful. You do not want to pry on this line. This is a refrigerant line. Don't want to put a hole in it, don't want to bend it. You don't want to get a face full of refrigerant. My car runs 134A, which is not too expensive, but if you run 1234YF, which there was a VIN split on the Golfs, um, this is really expensive. So be ultra careful here with your condenser. We'll just go ahead and do the same thing for the other side. You can actually take this whole thing out of the way if you'd like. Now both sides of the top do have this little clip that we need to press in. Again, being crazy careful, push the clip in and then gently pull up on the condenser. Just like that. I like to leave it right there until we're done with the other side. Same for the other side. Now, as you can see, our condenser is kind of hanging, and that's actually okay. I mean, these lines will do an all right job holding it in place, but for the other side, I don't want it to slip out. I don't want it to fall. I don't want to damage any of these lines. So I just threw a bungee cord on it just to kind of hold it from going too far. It's also resting on the ledge of the core support here but you never know, one little slip and it could go flying. So it makes me feel a little more comfortable to support it. You do what you feel is right, of course, but I like this method just as an extra safety precaution. All right, we are coming to our final steps for this job, at least getting the charge cooler out anyway. Anybody else feel like this has been uh, taking forever? I sure do. All right, our last steps are gonna be undoing these clips that hold the charge cooler in place. These are pretty stout clips. You can release them with a flat blade screwdriver. But I'll tell you, these are the kind of clips that feel like they're just about to break right before they release. So you wanna be super careful. So after trying a handful of different ways to do this, I think I found what is gonna be my favorite way to get this done. Now, a warning, you have gotta be insanely careful doing this. If you go in here like He-Man, uh, you're gonna break the charge cooler, you're gonna break the condenser, you're gonna break the core support, you are gonna break something. I'm not hating if you just cut these tabs off and put new ones on. But the way that I found to do this the easiest, take a small pry bar, we're gonna go behind the core support, but in front of the charge cooler, you can see my pry bar right back here, and I'm just gonna put gentle pressure on the charge cooler backwards, back towards the back of the vehicle. Not prying like I'm trying to take it out, not manhandling it or beating it up, just a little bit of pressure. A few millimeters of movement is all you're really looking for. You also wanna be careful not to break the clip that holds the condenser in. While applying that backwards pressure, go into your top clip, twist it, go to your bottom clip, twist it, then take your flat blade, go right in the middle, and just give it a gentle push, and it should come right out. See where I'm pushing right there, right through that hole? Just give it a little push and it should come right out. We're gonna do exactly the same thing for the other side, being equally careful doing it over here too. You might need to find a different place to pry. Okay, we'll go up a little bit higher on this side. Top clip, bottom clip, 
top clip again, bottom clip again, just in case. Oh, look at that. And then just gently tap it out. Okay, just like we did with the radiator, we can just lift this guy right on out. So the repair manual says, take it out from the top. However, I'm seeing that it actually comes out the bottom quite a bit easier. So whether you go from the bottom or the top doesn't seem to matter. I went down, even though I was planning to go out the top, seemed to drop down just fine from the bottom, through the bottom, to the bottom, with the bottom, bottom. Okie dokie, here is our original charge cooler. As you can see, plastic end tanks, pretty decent looking thing. Not terribly heavy though, we'll weigh them both in just a second. What I'm most curious about is the actual width of the charge cooler. So let's measure that. So it looks like we're right at 35 and a half millimeters. Let's compare that to the new one. Look at this old girl. What a beautiful piece here. Uh, I can already tell you it's considerably thicker than the one we took out. Let's measure to find out how much. We're at 35 and a half millimeters thick for the factory one. <laughs> Just for comparison, that's 35 millimeters. This one, 57.3, so we're quite a bit thicker. I can also tell you it is quite a bit heavier than that factory one as well. All right, let's weigh this old girl and see what she weighs. We'll call that seven pounds and nine ounces. Now my little scale wouldn't actually measure this one. It weighs too much, so we had to use the bathroom scale. We're coming in at 28.2 pounds, so significantly heavier than the factory one was. However, we can see this is quite a bit beefier of a component right here. Pretty, pretty, pretty. All right, let's transfer over some parts and get this old girl back installed in the car. We need to go ahead and swap over our brackets that hold our charge cooler on. We'll slide them off the old ones and slide it onto the new one. Make sure that these clips face what's gonna be the front of the car. You can put them on not both ways. Some of the other ones you could put on both ways. This one only fits one way, which is nice. Let's go ahead and get this guy in the car. I'll tell you, putting this in is gonna be harder than taking this one out because this one weighs, what, three times what the other one is. So I uh, may need an extra set of hands with this one. Okay, we are ready to install our new charge cooler. I'm gonna go from the bottom, see how that goes for us. Turn it the right way first, Charles. you're not falling far old girl well we're almost we need to get it up into the bottom clips here okay so we have our charge cooler kind of set into place it's in the tabs down at the bottom before you snap it into the core support we really want to get our condenser set onto the charge cooler what that means is we're going to get rid of our little strap that we were using to hold the condenser up we're going to take the condenser back behind this core support. We're gonna get it just set into the tabs right here on both sides of the charge cooler as best we can. You might not be able to get it in all the way, but we wanna get it close so that we can adjust it as needed. Now what we can do is snap our clips in that hold our charge cooler to the core support, then we'll adjust our condenser as needed. For this part, you're gonna need to lift up on the charge cooler slide it into place, and then you're gonna have to push it and you might even need to wiggle the charge cooler a little bit in order to snap that in. One side and the other. Now what we can do is we can work our charge cooler back and forth in order to get it into the channels and slide it down. Make sure it's in all four channels before you slide it down. It's gonna make life easier. Once you have the condenser fully seated, get one of the set screws that came into the kit and go ahead and snug it down. You don't want to tighten this super tight, just a little snuggy snug to hold the condenser in place. If you tighten this too tight, you end up, you can end up breaking the ear off of here. We don't want to do that. So just a little snug snug, do that for all four of them. Our next step is going to be reinstalling the radiator. We need to be extra careful when installing these that we don't damage the fins on the radiator, on the charge cooler, on the condenser. We got a lot of stuff going in and out and we want to be extra careful. Also, if you didn't drain all the coolant out of the radiator, be careful here. You don't want to get a big old bath of coolant while you're trying to install these parts. So the way I found to get the radiator in, the easiest way possible is from the bottom, go up really high on the driver's side, like way higher than you think you should have to. 
That'll allow you to get the passenger side into place, and then you can kind of rock the radiator down. Make sure that it locks into the clips on the new charge cooler. Now, in order to get the radiator snapped in on those top clips, you kind of got to reach your hand behind and push the clip down. I won't even be mad if you take a screwdriver and push the clip down a little bit in order to get it into place. All right, next let's get some of this front end stuff put back on. Now, these little slide pieces, this is what held the condenser into place on our factory setup. I tried and played around with putting these back on, but I don't really think they serve much of a purpose putting them back on. So go ahead and hold on to these though, because you are gonna need them if you ever put your stock charge cooler back on. As far as putting them back on, if you wanna try and fight and put them back on, what it'll be easier if you actually unclip the charge cooler and push it back a little bit and you can go ahead and slide them on that way. For me, I'm just gonna throw them in the box with an old charge cooler and keep them there. But we do wanna put these ducting pieces back in. The one that goes on the passenger side has this little door right here and we're gonna install these the same way we took them out. Slide them up, twist them into place and clip the clips, the three clips that we undid. Those will snap right in, super easy. Same thing on the driver's side. There we go, those are in place. Let's put this front bracket back on. Snap it in first. The screws that held that on were these three T30s. Now before you tighten those up, go ahead and find your wiring harness. Make sure you get that in the right spot. And that clips on just where it came from. Luckily there'll be witness marks if you forget exactly where it came from. Once that's clipped in, now go ahead and tighten it down. Next, let's go ahead and put our fans back into place. Go from the bottom up on these babies. Ooh, that's a snug fit. And if you remember right, you guessed it, they're held in with plastic clips. Snap that down into place. Make sure all four are in the proper location. Go ahead and get that connector plugged back in. This is the time to do it now so you don't end up forgetting it. Now for the rest of it, the order is not super duper important. However, I would like for you guys to do one thing. Get your coolant lines all hooked up as soon as you possibly can, right after you get the fans on. The reason being is bleeding coolant on these new cars can kind of be a pain in the butt. We wanna leave as much time for the air to just naturally bleed out of the system while we're putting all the rest of this back together. That way it'll make our life a little easier when we're trying to get the last little bit out. Make sure you give those a little tug and be sure they don't come right back off. Let's go ahead and attach this hard coolant pipe to our fan shroud. This was held in with two T30 screws. Remember, you're going into plastic. Be real careful, you don't need to go to town on this. If I had to guess, the torque spec is probably about four Newton meters if you really wanna put a torque wrench on this. Next up, let's go ahead and put our bumper cover back on. Now, before you do that, do a quick inspection. Make sure everything is attached, everything's bolted up at the front, everybody's there, everybody's happy, there's no clearance issues or anything like that. We look pretty good here on this one. Putting the bumper cover on is pretty much exactly the same as it was taking it off. You may wanna have a second set of hands here just to hold the bumper cover in place. We're gonna start by sliding it in the front side in the middle, then we'll work our way onto the outside. If you find that you're struggling to get part of this bumper cover on, a little bit of glass cleaner actually works really well. It acts as a lubricant to help slide clips into place. You don't have to worry about anything gunking up your bumper cover or your car, and then a simple wipe off and you're clean. So once the front and center is slid into place, we need to focus on where the bumper cover lines up to the fender. This should be about what it looks like. You may need to pull back on the bumper cover a little bit, and then this kind of just pops into place. You may also need to lift up on the bumper cover a little bit. You'll have to use your judgment, but sliding it back is pretty common. Let's go ahead and get our center grill back into place next. This is where that glass cleaner trick works super good. There's a channel on the bumper cover. There's a channel on the grill itself. We need to make sure that the channel of the grill goes into the channel of the bumper cover. We also need to make sure at the top, all of our clips get locked into place. And then what you can do is take a clean rag and any excess glass cleaner comes right off. You might even mess around and clean your car a little bit. Now, a lot of you guys have been asking about recalibration once we take this off. I've had this bumper cover off five or six times and never had to have it recalibrated, never had to have the adaptive cruise control recalibrated, I should say. That does not mean that you won't have to. Technically, if you remove this emblem, you are supposed to have your ACC, your adaptive cruise control, 
recalibrated. Keep that in mind. Go ahead and put our screws back in up top. Remember, this is the ones that are fancy. So next we need to move to underneath the vehicle and we have a handful of things to do down here. Most importantly, we need to put our boost pipes back on. Let's go ahead and start on the driver's side. Now, very first thing before you do anything, if you shoved any rags into this boost pipe for some reason, take them out of there. Also, on your charge cooler, there is a little cap that is clear. Take that off. You will have a bad time. You will be very disappointed in your charge cooler if you leave this on. Take this off. I'd like to put dielectric grease on both of these fittings. This will help our boost pipes go on a little bit easier. Now your kit came with two new clamps. We are gonna have to use those. The new clamps go onto the charge cooler side. You wanna make sure you orient this clamp in a way that you'll be able to get it on and off. We'll get our, our new clamp on. We'll also get our old clamp. Easiest way I've found to put this pipe on is to go ahead and put it on the side from the turbo first and then wiggle it onto the cooler. We'll get our clamp on over here. This is going to be an eight millimeter. You're gonna to need to tighten this guy down. This one is a seven millimeter. Yes, I would like them to match too. One thing I'm noticing you wanna pay real close attention to, right here, the distance between this clamp and this cable set. You don't want this clamp rubbing up against the cable set. Looks like it lays on the factory hose and on this hose, because there's some witness marks on it, but you wanna be careful that it's not the clamp that it's resting on. We don't want it to cut back through. All right, give that a wiggle. Make sure she's on good and snug. Let's do the other side. We are going to do exactly the same thing on the passenger side. Start off by taking our cap off. Clean any yuck off of that. Get our little bit of dielectric grease. Not a mandatory step, but boy, can it make life a little easier sometimes. Roll around for five or six minutes while you find your missing clamp. Make sure you don't have any junk inside the tube as well. That could be bad news. And we'll go ahead and get this old girl put on. There we go. Just a little massagey saji on there. For me, when I'm orienting clamps, I like to not necessarily see them, but what's more important to me is easy access. That's why this one's kind of tucked up here, so I don't have to like necessarily look at it, but it's easy to get to. You gotta do this in the way that makes you happy. You just need to watch your clearance between this coolant hose and the clamp. Once you have your boost pipes on, let's go ahead and put our, the rest of our underneath screws back in. Now you're going into plastic here, so be extra careful. Go ahead and get our belly pan on and our bottom screws for our side skirt. And of course, do that same thing on the other side. Before we put our screws in for our side skirts, we need to peel back on the driver's side and plug our bumper connector back in. Here's our connector right here. Simple, just plug it right back in. But if you forget to plug this in, you're gonna have a whole bunch of warning lights and probably some sadness too. So don't forget to plug that back in. And then we can go ahead and put our screws back in. For the driver's side, we have three that go through the belt skirt and one that goes up through the bumper. Now the one that goes up, you may need to tweak on the bumper cover a little bit to make sure that it's lined up properly. Ours looks pretty good, so we're just gonna go ahead and install this screw, and we'll do the same thing on the other side. Next up, if you took the wheels off, get your wheels put back on, and of course, properly torqued. Lower the car on the ground. We need to put the air intake on. We need to bleed the cooling system, and we're gonna go on a drive. Now, I got the car all the way back together. It's time to take it on our first test drive. A Couple of important things before you go on that drive. Do a super good inspection. Make sure you got everything hooked back up. Make sure that your coolant level is correct. Bleeding the coolant on these newer cars can be rather challenging. That's why I recommend using one of those bleeders that I showed you guys. I'll link that up so you can check it out. It really helps out a ton. Technically by the repair manual, you are supposed to open some coolant valves to properly bleed. Um, if you don't have a scan tool, then you're probably not gonna be able to do that at all. I did find though, if you use that bleeder, Drive the car around at a very low speed, but higher RPM, so say 15, 20 miles per hour in first gear, it will circulate that coolant much faster and you'll do a good job of getting the air bled out of the coolant on the first try. If you, for some reason, can't get the coolant bled, say you don't have heat, something like that, what you can do is lift the front of the car up only 
and that will put the coolant reservoir up at the highest point. That'll help bleed the air out a little bit. Little old school of a trick there. But again, you really do want to use one of those bleeder funnels that I showed you. Also, after your first test drive, when you get back, double check that coolant level and make sure it's not way, way low. Then the next day after the car is completely cooled down, you really want to check that coolant level one more time just to make sure that it is correct. That air pocket can bubble up to the top overnight and can leave you with a low coolant level. So be really, really cautious of that. Now, from a drivability standpoint, initially, I don't notice any difference with this new charge cooler versus the way the car behaved before. To fully capitalize on the benefits of a new charge cooler, you really need to do software and the rest of the stage two performance mods. Otherwise, you just put a pretty expensive charge cooler on that you might actually not need. While we're on this initial test drive, we wanna make sure we hit full boost a couple of times. That way we can pressurize that intake and that charge cooler system, make sure that a boost hose doesn't blow off or something like that. Now, if you do it yourself, it can take a few hours. If you're paying to have this done, from most of the research I've done, it seems like it's about a four, four and a half hour job. Of course, depending on where you take it, is gonna depend how much that is. That's about the ballpark that you're gonna be looking at. We already talked about ACC calibration. If you take it to the dealer, they're probably gonna have you do the calibration. I don't hate that. I would probably make you do it too if you brought it to me at the dealership, just to cover my own butt and make sure that I did the job correctly. Something else that I actually meant to mention earlier on this video that's cool about this charge cooler is on that passenger side, there's that tiny little port that's plugged off. That is actually a port for water meth injection, which is pretty neat that it has it already built in. So if you're gonna run water meth, that's your inlet for running water meth. Overall, I love the fit and finish of this charge cooler. I didn't have to cut anything. I didn't have to modify anything. It dropped legit right into the car, which is how I feel that most everything should be at least up to stage two. Once we start getting further into the modification process, I understand that things need to be tweaked and twisted and turned and moved. But at this level with straight bolt-on parts, I love that it dropped right in and I didn't have to modify the core support or anything else, still retain air conditioning, of course, and all of that. There is one thing that I found that I didn't love about the charge cooler, and that's the way that the radiator snaps into it. It left it kind of loose. So the radiator actually wiggles on the charge cooler. So what I did is I put a little bit of foam in there to help keep that from rattling around. I don't think that would cause any actual issues other than just like me knowing about it. So I wanted to make sure I took care of it. Now, that's something that you may wanna check on yours as well to see if that radiator's rattling around inside of the charge cooler. But to be fair, it's kind of a dumb way for the radiator to snap into the charge cooler. So there we have it. We are all done finally. I feel like that job took way longer than it should have, but it was a ton of fun. Now this is part of our full stage two quest. So we also have to do the downpipe. We also have to do the turbo inlet pipe. And then of course software. And once we get all that done, we'll go ahead and see just how much power she makes. If you're wondering, should I do a charge cooler without doing all the rest of the stage two stuff? I gotta tell you, probably not, unless you're in a super high performance driving situation. I would love to be able to monitor intake temperatures from the old original charge cooler to this one. However, the temperatures day to day have been very different. I'm not in a high performance driving situation. In fact, right now it's 42 degrees outside. So I don't think even at 42 degrees, we truly see the benefit of having that upgraded charge cooler, unless we had all the other stuff built around it. So I'm going to wrap it up there, guys. As always, questions or comments, drop them down below. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button and don't forget to subscribe. Be sure to check out the other stage two videos because they're a lot of fun. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll talk to you again next time. Wow.